Good morning, ACC. Welcome to today's campus conversation we'll, where we will be discussing the QEP or the Quality Enhancement Plan. My name is Anna Remmer. I'm the Director of Communication for Student Affairs and today I'll be your moderator. I'd also like to introduce the rest of our team. With us today, we have Dr. Richard Rhodes, our Chancellor. Good morning, Riverbed family. We also have Misty Rasmussen. She's our QEP co-chair and associate dean of planning and accreditation. Good morning, Riverbats. We have Missy Patterson with us. She's also our QEP co-chair and the other half of M&M, &M, uh, and she is a professor of psychology. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. We have LMC, that's Lisa Marie Coppoletta. She's an adjunct professor of communication studies. Good morning. We have Linda Smarzik. She's our Dean of Computer Science and Information Technology. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here, glad you're here. And also Arun John, Associate Professor of English. Good morning, everyone, glad to be here. And Jason Vedrine, a professor of communication studies. Good morning, everyone. So today's campus conversation will be highly interactive and we're really looking forward to your questions, um, seeing what you want to know more about. So if you look at the top right corner of the live stream window, you should see an icon that looks like a dialogue cloud or a little thought bubble. Click that icon. It should open the live stream chat feature. You'll be prompted to type your name. And once you do that and click enter or send, then you'll be able to leave comments, ideas, questions, and I'll be reviewing those as they come in and I'll share them with the panelists on this call so we can discuss and provide answers live during this call. So without further ado, let's get started. What is the QEP, Misty? And Misty, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you all, uh, River Bats, for being here this morning. We're so excited to have you here today to talk about ACC's QEP process and the QEP topic finalist. Some of you join, joining us uh, may be familiar with the QEP, and some of you might be asking yourselves, what is the QEP? The QEP stands for Quality Enhancement Plan. The QEP is required uh, component of ACC's 2023 decennial reaffirmation with our uh, regional accreditor, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, SAC COC. I know that's a lot. Um, and every 10 years, um, each college that's accredited by SAC COC must develop a new QEP. The QEP is a five-year action plan to improve student learning and or student success. So it can be one or the other or both. Uh, also, you'll notice at the bottom of the slide, there is a link to our QEP website. If you do wanna find out more information about the QEP, please visit that website, austincc.edu backslash QEP. Now I'm going to turn it over to Missy Patterson, my partner in crime, Team m, &M and uh, QEP co-chair, who's going to discuss where we are in the QEP process. Thanks so much, Misty. I wanted to let y'all know a little bit about the vast amount of work that our incredible topic selection committee has been doing. So we did a survey to just get ideas for themes that might be important for the QEP. We got 176 responses to that, and then we analyzed those themes and shared them back with the committee so that everyone would know what was top of mind for our Riverbat family. In addition, we had a topic suggestion form where people could actually turn in ideas for an actual QEP. On that, we got 16 suggestions, so we were going to review those, and we reviewed all 25 of the proposals from the academic master plan because we thought they might be really great ideas for our QEP. So in total, we had 41 topics that our committee reviewed. We developed two sets of criteria. 
The first round criteria was a rubric just to get at the basics. And 15 of those 41 topics met that level. And we then researched all of those topics very carefully. Um, then we reviewed all of those 15 topics and rated them on a rubric because, you know, I love myself a rubric. And we wound up rank ordering all of those topics. From that, our top four finalists were chosen. And it just so happened, it turned out that two of them were from the academic master plan and two were from our submission form. So those are the ones, those top four are the ones we're here to talk about today. Thank you, Missy. Yes, soon we will be giving the college a chance to vote as well. We will explain the details in a bit, but first, Dr. Rhodes will introduce our four topic finalists. Dr. Rhodes? All right, thanks, Misty. And let me just start and say it is such, I am really excited to be back with m and uh, and also, you know, I guess today we would call it M, Anna M. So we've added Anna to the, to the mix. So, and, and one thing I want to tell you too is that, you know, I, I've seen a number of these QEP processes uh, as I've been on some SACS visits. This is the best process in the galaxy, bar none. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for making this process great. Uh, so today we are going to show you videos about each of the four finalists. And while we're showing these in alphabetical order, please note that when you are voting, the topics will be presented randomly. And our first topic is creating a culture of inclusivity through universal design for learning, UDL. And we'll watch the video and then give you a chance to ask a few questions. Imagine a future where all students are able to participate in and progress through their course of study because there are no unintended barriers to instruction. Hi, my name is LMC, Professor Lisa Marie Coppoletta from the Department of Communication Studies, and I'm here today to talk to you about a possible QEP topic, creating a culture of inclusivity through universal design for learning. This topic is all about universal design for learning. This is a collection of best practices that ensures course materials are accessible to all students from the get-go. If this topic is chosen, it will offer faculty training and stipends so they can update their own courses utilizing UDL. Best practices in UDL include a wide range of tools, such as providing students with written and spoken instructions, engaging students in multiple types of activities, and connecting class activities explicitly to learning goals, allowing students some control over their assignments, and providing opportunities and time for students to reflect on their learning. UDL will support student success by, and learning by reducing teaching and learning barriers, increasing engagement and achievement for all students, not just those with disabilities. Please vote for our topic because ACC has a goal of equity for all students. UDL is a method that supports equity in student success, outcomes, but faculty need training and support to implement it. They need time to try out new techniques and learn from their colleagues. This topic ensures that faculty have the opportunity to explore the benefits of UDL to support student learning. So I'm monitoring the chat right now. I'm not seeing any particular questions come up just yet. Um, however, I would like to ask some questions perhaps while our audience thinks of a question that they may have regarding UDL. Um, LMC, can you speak about why this topic is so important to you? Anything additional that you want to add that wasn't covered in the video? 
Well, you know, we all have our own challenges. You think about someone who may be a musical genius. They may struggle with learning to read music, but they can play by ear. And I think that this QEP topic would, uh, would foster the strengths of our students. Also, it's aligned with the different chancellor priorities, such as reducing equity gaps, modernizing ACC's technology resources, and providing exceptional online education. Whether it's utilizing different apps or different teaching styles for visual or auditory, as well as kinesthetic, I think that this QEP would provide our students with an opportunity to prepare themselves for the job market, as well as completing their degree successfully. Wonderful. I'll keep an eye on the chat to see if anybody else chimes in with uh, future questions. And if so, we might be able to round back if time allows. Um, but just a reminder to our audience, please uh, make use of the chat box to provide us with any questions that you may have regarding the QEP videos that play. Dr. Rhodes, would you like to announce the next video? Certainly. Our second topic is digital fluency for today's jobs. Imagine a future where ACC students are equipped with the digital fluency skills needed to obtain, at the very minimum, a middle skills job that pays a livable wage. Today's jobs are undergoing an accelerated digital transformation in almost every sector and industry. This has amplified both opportunity and inequality, making it critical to address the need for digital fluency skills. But there's a problem. The U.S. has a digital skills gap. 30% of all U.S. workers have little to no digital skills. This number is even higher for Black and Latinx workers. In Austin, jobs requiring mid to high digital skills make up nearly three quarters of all job openings. Hi, my name is Linda Smarzik, Dean of Computer Science and Information Technology. And I'm Pamela Saez, the Director of Today's Jobs. And we're here to talk with you about a possible QEP topic, Digital Fluency for Today's Jobs which is a partnership between academic instruction and student affairs. The topic is all about developing digital fluency skills, the ability to use technologies competently and strategically to learn, work, and function in society. When one has an understanding of a variety of software and basic languages, such as the Microsoft, Google, and Apple suites, Photoshop, HTML, CSS, and much, much more, one develops digital fluency. The ability to solve problems and communicate through a high demand digital skill set. It will support student success in learning by strengthening both academic performance and career readiness through mastery of digital competencies by the way of an adaptive competency based education modality combined with open education resources and the awarding of micro and end of course badges. The results, a robust, digitally focused environment that supports the 21st century student learning experience. Please vote for our topic because digital fluency provides transferable skills and workforce resiliency in a time of constant disruption. While providing equitable career pathways leading to social and economic mobility. Thank you for considering this project as the QEP initiative. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but that doesn't mean that they won't come up in a little bit. Linda, I'm keeping note as they're coming in. We will have one to follow up with LMC later. Uh, it's a wonderful one from Teresa Glenn, but let me go ahead and ask you this. Um, explain a little bit about how this particular topic would lead to student success. Sure, Anna. You know, one of the things that people think is that our digital natives, our millennials, et cetera, have great digital skill set. But there's some data, there's research. They're fantastic on their devices with their apps. They're great with that. But when it actually comes to um, working with the computer, in fact, about a quarter of our 16 to 34 year olds cannot use a computer. Even more, interesting is that 58% of the millennials lack 
these problem solving skills that imbibes digital fluency. And so when you think of stringing together a number of software's languages, that allows one to solve a problem as opposed to knowing a one-off, knowing a Microsoft Word or Photoshop by itself. So what this does is it allows one to solve these problems. It becomes a precursor on top of that to even developing and furthering their digital skill set into perhaps my area, into software development or into architectural engineering design or into a number of the other areas that include all things uh, that include not architecture, that include all things digital. Uh, we know that the student will earn with the higher the digital uh, skill set, the higher the wages. So not only will this become an equitable solution for students to be able to move through their learning, but also that they get out and get a middle skills jobs. Um, it's very important to us, very passionate about it. And uh, we believe that we can affect learning in a number of ways through these modalities. Think of this as being embedded, not only as four, course, four courses in OSA, but being embedded into curriculum, being offered as a one-off for uh, as a non-credit that aligns with strategies for today's jobs, which you're very familiar with, Anna and that it be it, it, even faculty and staff can use this. So we're very passionate about this, as you can see. The passion shows we have a wonderful question in the chat. Might be one for you to answer, Linda. Um, you spoke to it a little bit, but is it possible to merge both the UDL that LMC <laughs> talked uh, so eloquently about and the Digital Fluency Initiative? What could that commingling look like? You know, um, I saw that coming, I must admit. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. That would take some uh, discussion, some negotiation, some working, planning, strategy. Uh, I never say never about anything, but I did hear that question pop up before this uh, forum showed up. Well, there are a I was going to say there's a variety of different ways that people can learn uh, digital technology. So for those who struggle with learning, with reading, they can utilize podcasts or videos or hands-on learning, and then different applications for prep for the workforce, as well as their different coursework. So, and, and I think also with the digital technology, that would be a wonderful opportunity for the creative students to give them a venue into more um, tech, like uh, different venues of, of business where their skills could be harnessed. You know, one last thing, one of the pieces that we would like to do this is embed the NACE core competencies as well, uh, to be able to have a student be able to work with each other, collaborate, being able to present. And that's very, you can learn technical skills all day long, but if you don't have those skills, those professional skills, it, uh, you know, it's a little bit harder to get through an interview. Thank you so much. All right, I think it's time for us to move along to our third video. Dr. Rhodes, what do we have next? All right, thanks, Anna. Our third topic is investing in the liberal arts, redesigning gateway courses. Imagine a future in which faculty share their passion for their disciplines with students in ways that place the student's experience of the discipline at the center of everything that happens in class. Imagine a future in which professors have built equity and inclusion, not just into their courses, but into readings and assignments. Imagine courses that prepare students not just for the next test, but for the next course and the next phase of their education and for the lives of engagement in their jobs, communities, and families. Hello, I'm Matthew dowdell Laurent, Dean of Liberal Arts, Humanities, and Communication. Hi, my name is Arun John, and I'm chair of the Liberal Arts Gateway Program here in Humanities and Communication. We're here to talk to you about a possible QEP topic, investing in the liberal arts, redesigning gateway courses. This QEP topic is about redesigning the liberal arts gateway course curricula and using a philosophical framework to build equity and inclusion into every course from the ground up by redesigning gateway courses and harnessing college resources in a holistic and efficient manner. 
This project will intertwine lessons and assignments with multiple avenues of student support, including tutors, counselors, learning labs, faculty mentors, even opportunities outside of academia. It will do this by expanding the program from its current form and by encouraging collaborations across disciplines and across areas of study throughout the college. This topic will support student success in learning by putting the student experience center stage through engaging themes, interesting assignments, and course activities that invite and center the students' perspectives and their aspirations. This should result in improved course completion and course persistence rates. We'd like you to vote for our topic for QEP because it's grounded in course redesign principles from the Gardner Institute, which have been demonstrated to be effective. It's faculty-driven, student-centered, with equity at its core. All right, wonderful. I know there's a little bit of a delay between videos playing and questions coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off with one for you, Arun. Um, what was it about this topic that inspired you or that you feel is so important? So um, one of the things that we found uh, in, uh, in sort of through research is that uh, the student experience in gateway courses really are a predictor of their success down the line, both academically and in terms of their career. Um, and so one of the things that we did when we redesigned sort of, we started this in a small scale in the, in the um, in humanities and, and liberal arts, we started to notice uh, a, a students being more engaged in their courses, uh, more engaged in their coursework, and preliminary data seem to suggest that they're actually doing well and persisting um, in, into uh, future courses. So that's kind of, uh, that was the impetus behind um, sort of starting this program, at least on a small scale in liberal arts. And now we want to kind of expand and grow it. Thank you so much. Dr. Rhodes, video number four. Our fourth topic is on the right track. Imagine a future where faculty without a writing background move away from traditional assessment. They learn how to support students through the writing process. They incorporate writing into their classes and can turn to specialized tutoring support through the ACC Learning Labs for students. Hi, my name is LMC, Professor Lisa Marie Coppoletta from the Department of Communication Studies. And I'm here today to talk to you about a possible QEP topic on the right track. This topic is all about first integrating effective writing processes and practices into all courses requiring writing. It will then encourage faculty outside of the writing discipline to integrate effective writing practices into their classrooms. Faculty will receive training in the fundamentals of technical writing so they can reinforce what students have learned in English 1301 and 1302 to improve the quality of the writing outside of writing courses. It will support student success and learning by improving students' writing skills as they progress through the program of study, which improves student performance, retention, transfer, and employment. Please vote for our topic because it empowers faculty to teach writing in their classrooms and empowers students to communicate about their knowledge in multiple disciplines. Since employers and transfer institutions value writing very highly, ACC graduates will be more likely to be effective in their future endeavors. All right, and we have Jason with us to talk about On the Right Track. First of all, I love a good pun, so I appreciate the title of um, this proposal. But what would this mean in terms of student success? That's a great question, Anna. And um, first, let me thank uh, Lisa Marie for stepping in and uh, doing the video for me. So what would this mean for student success? Is that correct? <clears throat> I see this helping with student success. And let me start by giving a quote. There was a philosopher by the name of Peter Kraft who teaches out of Boston College who said, muddled thinking 
is revealed in muddled writing and muddled writing reveals muddled thinking. So how we write really conveys what we're thinking about and clarifies our thought process. So if we're able to help students clarify what it is that they are thinking about, regardless of whatever the subject matter is, I think that can improve their grades, right? So the instructor would clearly understand what they're getting at. And I would also say this could really be effective uh, with the chancellor's third priority on exceptional online education, because a lot of, uh, my, I would think that a lot of the online assignments uh, would require writing skills and so forth. So I think it would really help in, in that area as well. Excellent, thank you so much. We're doing great on time. Um, we have about 15 minutes to cover some questions that came in chat uh, during the videos playing. So I wanted to start off with one from uh, Teresa Glenn. And uh, first of all, she said, bravo, Lisa. Um, so this is for you, LMC. What is the difference between UDL and the active and collaborative learning techniques we're practicing, or even the QM practices that we're implementing? What would be the difference there? That's great. It would be like Emerald. We would kick it up a notch. And so we, and that's what's so nice about this proposal is that we have all the resources, the mechanisms in place, and it would provide faculty with an opportunity for additional training, which obviously would enhance completion rate and student job market. But what it does is, is it reinforces what we're doing now that's well, and it gives us some new game. Right, it gives us some new toolkits and allows faculty to work collaboratively with each other. So whether it's a new app or a new process of creating your own podcast or videos, captioning for our students, OER resources, um, making you know like our Blackboard sites uh, more accessible with the attachments and so forth. And so some of the faculty have gone through that training. But if, if we have all of our faculty in a uniform fashion being able to go through that program and possibly potentially get paid for that, it's a win-win for not only the students, our departments, but also for the faculty to enhance their pedagogical practices. Wonderful. We had an additional question come in from Galen Scott. Um, are we going to be speaking to the scope of these proposals? Will all faculty participate in UDL if it's chosen, for instance? And that might uh, go through some of the other proposals that came up. So M&M, is that more of a question for you since it's overarching? Why don't you take that one, Misty? Uh, so right now, we are selecting the topic. The next committee will be fully developing the five-year plan. So right now you're kind of getting a surface. And when this development committee gets together, some of the scope could change depending on the research that we uh, look at. And that'll be best practices, what other institutions are doing, what's worked and what has not. Um, so we will not be going into uh, the, the scope, so to speak, at this moment. So we're, we're voting on that, that idea that we want to fully develop. I hope that I answered your question, Galen. And Misty, Misty you want to add yeah, thanks. I would just say that, you know, the QEP, we're not required that every single person at the institution is involved, but it is supposed to, um, you know, affect a, a, bride, a broad swath of the college. So in terms of how broad it will be, well, hopefully it will affect a good number of faculty and students and departments, but the topic development committee, as Misty said, will be the group that really determines that. Thank you, Missy. Thank you. We had a wonderful comment in the chat from Kathleen Jurgens. She shared that adult education students often mention the benefit of online classes as increasing their digital and job skills. So I wanted to be able to share that comment with y'all. Uh, and then also Teresa Glenn shared uh, that she loves the idea of the digital QEP, but what would this mean for faculty that have never approached this topic before? And what if they're not digital natives themselves? What would that mean for them? Uh, that's a great question, Teresa. Um, one of the things that's so um, nice about this 
topic is that it has a number of legs, a number of arms. One of them is what we're working with and collaborating with, with Dean, um, uh, Dean Fan, is to be able to embed modules inside of 10 courses in childcare. With that will come training for the faculty to be able to work with a module of some sort in their actual curriculum. So we've been in discussions and I'm working with this. And I would imagine it was what was just said, it's not a everybody must do this, but they're gonna be early adopters, people who want to build a proof of concept on this, I would imagine. And, uh, and then from there, it uh, may, or, may or may not spread out, but we anticipate that there will be training for faculty available as well, not only as modules embedded inside the curriculum for students, but training for faculty who are interested in this coursework as well. Excellent. We had a, another great question come in through the chat. Arun, this one's for you. You spoke a little bit about that uh, liberal arts gateway project that, you, that you're already currently working on. Do you have any early data on student impact? What is that looking like? So um, we do have some early preliminary data and the data looks really good. Um, and uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of talk about uh, in, in terms of why we are getting uh, such student engagement is that the courses themselves have become much more relevant to students' lives. Um, and so, for example, I can give you a small example of, of the kind of collaborative work that's been started in the Liberal Arts Gateway. We developed two composition courses in tandem with uh, the nursing department uh, that focused on uh, health sciences um, writing, right? Uh, and so um, students who are interested in the health sciences go into uh, sort of those composition courses, but that was, those were developed purely through uh, faculty collaboration. So if you can imagine uh, that model being sort of uh, ramped up and rolled out, there could be all these possibilities opening up uh, across the college. And I think one of the things that we really need to do, at least with gateway courses, is to kind of make those relevant to the lives of our students uh, and what they're doing in college. Um, so that's kind of uh, sort of the, the that's why the, the data that we're getting early on seems to indicate that students are really engaged uh, and seem to uh, persist in those cars classes. I love that example, and this is totally purely qualitative conversation with my mentee data, but she actually took part in one of those uh, writing courses for nursing students, and she spoke to the value of it, that it was really cool to have uh, a writing assignment that was related to what she was studying. So um, thank you for sharing that. We have a, a really uh, excellent comment in the, in the chat box from, uh, Susan Thomason, the gateway course redesign could incorporate elements of the other three topics for a robust redesign grounded in equity. So I wanted to be able to share that uh, comment with y'all. Um, and Galen, uh, plus one that, she said, good thought, Susie. Um, so I just wanted to be able to share that with you. Uh, Kathleen Jurgens uh, has just commented, will the liberal arts topic keep the rigor while not excluding those who are first-generation college students. We've learned that some AE students are discouraged from these intense intro courses. Did you want me to uh, respond to that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, yes. Um, so one of the things that we're really focused on in Liberal Arts Gateway is to um, make the, the course material relevant to student lives, right? And that includes students who may be first generation students, et cetera. Uh, and uh, just to kind of give you an example of what, uh, what um, you know, so I gave you the nursing example. Another course that we, a uh, couple of courses that we teach in the Liberal Arts Gateway is that we have a composition course um, focused on food uh, and, um, uh, and both a comp one and comp two. And students um, find that topic really relevant to their lives. Uh, and so we, we tend to kind of um, take the student experience into consideration when designing and redesigning our courses. So yes, uh, definitely with an eye on equity uh, when we work on these course redesigns. Jason, I also wanted to allow you time, if at all possible, with the concept of on the right track. Is there anything that you wanted to add regarding um, some of these AE students who are coming into, you know, writing courses 
Uh, is there anything uh, regarding your proposal that you'd want to add to that question? Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm not sure if there's too much to add. Um, I think the main thing that we all know is that students need to be able to convey their thoughts through written form of communication. And so that uh, improving that particular skill will help them not only succeed in college, but also succeed in the workplace. And I, if I can add one other thing, I like what Susie had to say that it seems like a lot of these topics can kind of tie into one another. So. Wonderful, thank you. So currently we have no other questions in the chat box. I'm happy to continue monitoring that. Um, but would we like to start talking about um, what happens next, Dr. Rhodes? All right, Anna. And what, let me say, wow. Uh, you know, we've just learned about the, the four QEP finalist topics. And, uh, you know, I, I just have to say, you know, I'm just blown away by how, how good these are. I mean, this is fantastic work. And so I want to say thank you to all four teams. Uh, so what does that mean? What is next, Team m, &M? Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. So now you all can go and vote. Uh, if you notice on the slide, uh, there is a vote now button, but also the website um, is right below that. And if the tech team could just please drop that in the chat box so you all can uh, get to the uh, the voting survey that way as well. Uh, if you notice the finalists on the slider to the left, they're in uh, alphabetical order. Um, so no, no uh, you know, particular order than that. And we want you all to let us know what you feel uh, should be our next QEP. And with that being said, Missy, I'm gonna give it to you. Thanks, Misty. I just want to let everyone know that when you go to the survey, you're going to be given the list of the topic finalists. Once again, you're going to be able to read a blurb about them. I love that word blurb. Um, and then you'll also have an opportunity to rewatch the video. You don't have to do that, but we just put them on the survey to make that possible for you. Um, and then you'll be asked to rank the four finalists. And there's just a really nice slider and you can just slide your top choice up to the top, your bottom choice at the bottom, but you'll be able to basically assess all four finalists and order them in terms of your preference. Voting is open now and it will stay open until September 23rd. So that's really what we're doing with the survey and we're excited to hear your thoughts. Dr. Rhodes, you can give the next steps. All right. You know, uh, once the voting is over, we're going to announce the winning QEP topic at the General Assembly, which is held on October the 1st. And uh, so now we, we want to kind of open it up and have conversation uh, with you about uh, any questions that you have on the process um, or additional questions you have on the, on the QEP itself. So we're open for that. While we're waiting, I just, you know, once again, I just want to say thank you to Missy and Misty. Um, this process has just been phenomenal. Uh, just uh, congratulations uh, on this. And I, I'll tell you, I'm looking forward to uh, the winning project. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a shame we can't just have all four. And maybe we can. Very well said, Dr. Rhodes, and I want to extend my thanks to, to some unsung heroes in this process. Stephanie Vermillion and Taylor Kokas are the production team behind those videos, and they rocked it out. And I just think the videos really do a great job of showing the topics to everybody. And I also want to thank our topic selection committee. You all know who you are, and you are some of the hardest working people um, developing all of these topics to the point that they could be shared with our community. So wanted to just share those thank yous. And I just wanna thank the folks that um, agreed to do the videos on these topics as well. 
Thank you so much for being so flexible and for Anna, who's also on the topic selection committee and LMC, um, Anna for being our moderator today. Um, I have said this before um, to the committee, but uh, you know, my role at the college is to make sure that we stay in compliance with uh, SAC COC um, principles. And I've been on a lot of visits and I've uh, been through a lot of SACs reporting and visits and this topic selection committee has been the very best committee that I have ever worked with. And I'm not just saying that, I mean, it is true, believe me, um, it has been the easiest process because um, we have some really, really hard working people that stick to the deadlines that we give them. So thank you all so much. And thank so you, Anna. You are a, an absolute phenomenal moderator. This please has been a lot think, of fun. Yeah, don't and please don't think about doing your own show here somewhere. <laughs> no, no. This is this is purely fun. I'm have I really enjoy getting the opportunity to get folks engaged in conversation. Um, so this was this was a natural fit, and it's it's been fun uh, being the substitute uh, for today. So thank you all so much for for allowing me a seat at the table. It's been it's been a good time. There is a running question uh, going on in the chat, um, and it kind of harkens back a little bit to. Uh, what Susie shared um, in with the idea of blending some of these QEP topics together, um, that that would be the ultimate way to engage everyone. Uh, Teresa followed up with a question asking, would there be a space on the survey if we would like the committee to consider a hybrid or a blend of these ideas? Um, and if not, uh, what could that discussion or conversation look like? Well, I'll dive into that if that's okay. I do want to let y'all know after you rank order the topics on the survey, there's an open ended question because we anticipated that y'all might have some comments like that. So if you're excited about two or more of these or blending a bunch of them, please give those suggestions to us and we will pass those on to the topic development committee. They'll be able to utilize those suggestions in making the final QEP the best it can be. Okay, so I have a question. Um, why is it important for students, faculty, staff, the community, et cetera, uh, to vote on the final QEP? Why does it matter? Your voice matters. It's important for people to have, I mean, we all know the quote unquote buy-in is important, but it's not just buying, it's becoming a part of the process. And I believe that not only for faculty and students, but also for staff, and so that we can have a voice of how we roll this out. And this is an opportunity. Was it every three years or four years, Misty? How often does the uh, QEP roll around? It's it's every five years. So um, it, it's, it's every five years. Yeah, to make it better, so you can be the voice for the next group of faculty and students. And so, and that's something that we've talked about in the larger cultural context. So why not start here at ACC? You know, I, I might add too that, you know, uh, it, it is an expression of the values of the three C's that we talk about. Uh, and especially, you know, we're, we're talking about collaboration and that's, that's what this is all about. It's about connection and how, we, how do we connect both internally but externally uh, and with our students especially uh, and caring. And so it's coming together as, uh, as a community. And, you know, we've invested and we've talked a lot and, and we saw that on every one of these uh, presentations is the idea of inclusion. And how can we be more inclusive than giving everybody the opportunity to, to take advantage and have a voice uh, in the future? And, uh, you know, what we do as a college in making sure that our, our students are successful, that's our North Star. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all. Um, let's see, while I wait for more uh, questions in the chat, I do have some some more follow-up questions. Um, so general assembly happens, uh, we announce the winner, 
who implements this QEP? Like what happens next? What does that look like? And I'm wondering, Misty, would, would you be able to take that one? Yes, absolutely, Anna. So the next step after we find out what this topic is going to be on September 24th, um, Missy and I will definitely be reaching out to folks rather quickly um, to get the committee together and it's called the development committee. And so what that committee is going to do is develop that five-year action plan for that selected QEP topic. And they'll be establishing a timeline, all the steps required to carry it out. We'll do even more research to make sure that what we're doing is actually going to work and, um, and fulfill the goals and outcomes that we have for it. Um, so we are gonna need folks who are experts about the selected topic. So uh, <clears throat> be ready folks, uh, if you uh, fall in, into that area that is selected, okay? <laughs> and I'll and just that, add. Oh, oh and that sorry. Committee, sorry. <laughs> and that committee is going to going to be meeting from October 2021 through August of 2022. And in fact, some of the folks on the development committee will be moving to the implementation committee as well. Um, not all, but, but, but a majority of those folks. And I hope that that answered the question, Anna and Missy. You want to add something to that? Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, there is a third committee, but you just <laughs> mentioned it. So that's the implementation committee. So after the development group makes the plan, then we'll have a group of core people um, who are tasked with leading the actual implementation, and that'll be our implementation committee. Thank you, Missy. Hey, Misty, can you talk just a little bit, too, about the uh, SACS visitation team and the QEP and how that uh, works together? Yes, Dr. Rhodes. So uh, the SACS uh, visitors who are our peers, um, they're people like me and you. Um, they will come in October. I believe that visit is October the 24th through the 27th of 2022. And their main focus um, is to help us make our QEP better. They will follow up on any um, uh, issues maybe that we had with our standards or whatever, and there's some standards they have to re-review um, on site, but that's the focus. And we will um, have a, a group who will present the QEP to, that, uh, to those evaluators. And that will be um, folks from the development committee and the implementation committee. And Missy and I will be very involved. Um, I also do mock um, interviews and reviews before the visit because I want everyone to feel comfortable and there's no angst. So you know kind of what to expect. Um, and so they're there to consult us. So it's really nice because the, the folks will um, point out things maybe that we didn't think about because we're so attached to it. Um, they do not have to approve the topic. It used to be that they had to approve it. They don't do that anymore. So the topic that we choose um, is the topic that will move forward uh, for the next five years. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing once we uh, this topic is selected, um, we will be um, requesting um, a basically it's a reviewer or someone that is an expert in our QEP area that will sit on that committee as well. Um, we send three names um, to our SAC COC vice president on the individual that we want to review our QEP. This person is not a, a SACS evaluator, so to speak. They're kind of um an independent little consultant. So that's their main role on the committee. However, the entire um, committee will also be providing input as well um, on the QEP. Uh, so once we select that topic, we'll start researching the experts out there um, that will also help us improve on our QEP. Um, we do submit that QEP uh, to the uh, the SAC COC on-site committee is typically August, September timeframe. It's about six weeks before the visit. Um, so we do have some time to develop and, 
and uh, perfect that. Now, the document itself cannot be more than 100 pages. And I like to tell people it's like a mini dissertation um, in a sense, because you have to have a literature review and all that good stuff. Um, but it's pretty detailed. Um, but after 100 pages, they stop reading. So we are not going to go past 100 pages. <laughs> the evaluators, that is, stop reading. Uh, yeah, so one of the other things is we want folks also to keep informed. And if you follow us on the website, we have all the presentations, all the meetings, all the information about the committees, what a QEP is um, on our QEP website. So we want to make sure that our staff, faculty, and students all are aware of the QEP uh, process, uh, especially the topic. Um, you'll notice that maybe some evaluators will be walking around at, on the site visit and just randomly ask a student if they know what the QEP is and what the importance of that is. Um, and then so we want to make sure that we have everyone involved and that you all have a voice too. Um, so another thing that will happen is the committee that comes will also interview various people. So they'll have like a staff group interview of faculty and students. And like I had said before, I do do mock interviews before. So I'll make sure that the groups that we choose, I, we do get to choose who those are beforehand. Um, I will be able to at least prep y'all um, so that you know what, what uh, questions to expect. That doesn't mean they, they may ask questions outside of what I've asked you, but usually not. Um, but I just don't want anyone to be nervous. That's why I do those. Uh, so did I answer that? I see some questions coming through. Dr. Rhodes, was that thorough enough? That was fantastic. You know, uh, some of the things that, you, you know, that you mentioned, number one, it, it, we need to, to show that it was a very inclusive process. Uh, and then, uh, like Misty said, when they visit, you know, they're going to be talking to students. And, and so um, there's got to be quite a bit of uh, marketing, uh, you know, and, and communication to make sure that people are aware of what the QEP and what it means to them. Uh, and the other thing I was going to say, you know, that was a great improvement that Sachs made, because I remember uh, in the olden days where uh, the QEP did have to be approved by the committee. And that was really hard because, you know, colleges put a lot of time and effort uh, and they put their heart and soul into developing this QEP. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's make or break when the committee visited to say, yes, we approve it and you can go forward or not. And so that, that change really, I think, uh, makes a big difference in allowing us to move forward uh, before the site visit, basically. Yes, absolutely. And it was so stressful before for everyone. <laughs> I had one quick question for you, Dr. Rhodes. Um, in regarding the QEP, what sorts of resources is the college committing to the QEP? What does that look like? Yeah, and that's part of the process is to come up with what, what is the budget necessary uh, to implement this QEP over the next five years. And we have a commitment to make that happen. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what we have to build into it. And, and, and that's, you know, part of this whole process is developing it. So we also have the plan, the, the time to plan and put it into the budget for the following years. Excellent. It looks like Teresa Glenn wants to make sure that we have a line item in that budget for t-shirts. We need QEP t-shirts. <laughs> um, she still has her blue math QEP shirt. So uh, we need to give her a refresh on, on that. Um, and then I just had one quick question. I know that we're drawing a near to um, the end of our conversation, but there was a, a great question in the chat uh, from Kathleen Jurgens regarding um, Purpose and belonging. Our colleagues in T-LED are putting a lot of emphasis on purpose and belonging. And, and what does that mean to ensure that ACC is student ready, that our students have a space and a place here where they feel heard, belong, included? Um, 
how would the QEP fit into that theme? Um, so for our, our panel, Jason, Arun, LMC, Linda, um, how, how does your QEP proposal relate to purpose and belonging for our students? You belong at ACC regardless of your disabilities or perceived disabilities. Like in my, my discipline, oftentimes students have speech anxiety. And what I teach my students is that is a superpower once you overcome your fear. If you're an English as a second language student, international student, you belong here as a river bat. Even if you have different learning styles, going back to the piano genius, he or she may not be able to read music, but they can hear music and they become a virtuoso. So your voice is not only important here at ACC, but your voice is key in the larger social context. And I believe that with one, regardless of which QVP is selected, we will take our faculty, our students and our staff into uncharted territory to overcome any perceived obstacles and ultimately become victorious in whatever goals we have, whether it's the workforce or completing our degree. I'd like to add that with us with Digital Fluency for Today's Jobs, each course has uh, a capstone project at the end of it. There's a capstone at the end of the three courses and the course itself. And with this, what this involves is being able to work with an industry partner to solve a problem of some sort. So, and bringing those NACE core competencies where students feel like they're able to work together, where students are, have that belonging and they have the purpose of being able to, oh, I can see how this learning this digital skill set is a per will create purpose for me in getting out into the work world. So with it, that's embedded along there. And I didn't think of calling it purpose and belonging to uh, Susie's team, but actually great way to um, to name that. And I'd like to actually um, add to uh, Matthew Dodd-Laurent, our dean, um, said has a saying, liberal arts can change the world. And I really do think that's true because if, because if you think about these gateway courses, these are the first courses that students encounter when they come into college. And if th that's where you kind of create the sense of inclusion, the sense of a community, uh, and by, by making the, the course material relevant uh, to um, their lives, well, we would promote uh, the idea of uh, create a sense of belonging uh, in their lives. And that's kind of what I'd like to say about the liberal arts uh, redesign process as well. Jason, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are short on time. Um, it is 10.58, and I know that we have to move to closing remarks. Um, Missy, or Dr. Rhodes, I'm sorry. Uh, what would you like to say? Yeah, I would just say thank you to everybody for uh, your participation in this uh, and the presentations, but also thank you to the audience that's been listening and adding questions. Uh, and Teresa Glenn, we will have t-shirts um, as a part of the budget line item. Um, but once again, you know, thank you, Anna, for a wonderful job. Missy, Misty, fantastic. Uh, as always, the M&Ms are, are quite a, a dynamic duo. And then uh, all the presenters, just thank you so much. Thank you for putting uh, so much time, uh, effort, and interest into making this better for our students. Thanks, Dr. Rhodes. I just want to remind everybody to please use either one of these links, the one that's in the white box there that will get you directly to the survey. The one down at the bottom, the austincc.edu slash QEP, that'll take you to our main QEP website so you can learn more. There's additional information about the voting process there as well. So just remember to vote before September 23rd so we can hear your voice. Hey, Misty, can you share some information about the next committee in case people want to get involved? Yes, so we talked about this earlier, but once that final topic is announced, um, we will be reaching out to folks to fill the next committee, the development committee, who will help us 
develop that five-year plan. Um, some future opportunities for, for everyone. Um, you know, the implementation committee is another option that'll be coming up. Um, also feel free to provide uh, Missy and I any input through the process, even if you're not involved on the committees. And we also want you to stay informed by keeping up to date by following our website, austincc.edu backslash QEP. And I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. And please, please, please go and vote. We want to hear your voices. And that's it. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.